Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, uh, meeting today. Uh, just a quick uh, uh, remark about what we saw last time we met together some lessons ago. Uh, probably you will remember that we focused our analysis on uh, the different parties involved into a project finance transactions. We have analyzed the different parties involved and we have analyzed the different contracts that the SPV signs with these counterparties. We have also seen that these contracts are a way of, uh, in a sense, allocating rights and obligations between the different parties. As we will see next time uh, we meet, we will also see that these contracts are ways of uh, making a risk management process inside the project finance. But for the moment, the topic of today is uh, to go in more depth in uh, one uh, of the relationship that the project company had, has with uh, the other participants in the deal, namely with lending banks. We haven't said very much about the relationship between the SPV and uh, the investing bank. It's now the time to have a careful look of, uh, as to what banks do, uh, which kind of loans they award to the SPV, the structure of the loan, the fees of the loan, and some other contractual arrangements. So basically, uh, my scope today is to analyze with you uh, some key points that relates to the relation between lending banks and project companies. In particular, I will, first of all, identify the different roles that banks can play into a project finance transactions. And so uh, my idea is to start with the role of banks. And since in a project finance transaction uh, it is very rare that only one bank awards all the amount of funds to the SPV, it's very likely that these funds will be awarded by a syndication group. And so, talking about role of banks, uh, it's useful to us uh, also in order to analyze the syndication process. So, role of banks and then syndication. Second key point. Uh, since project finance is basically a question of credit, because most part of funds is provided by a bank, uh, one of the key topics is which is uh, the form of payment for such kind of credit that banks give to an SPD. It is a problem of fees on one side and interest rate on the other side. So my scope will be to analyze with you uh, both the structure of the fees and the way the interest rate is calculated inside the project finance transaction. So uh, we have to analyze fee structures and interest rates. Third key point, uh, a project finance is a very a special kind of deal. And it is very rare that normal uh, loans, loans with standard features, can be applied to a project finance transaction. Uh, it is important, so, for us to identify which kind of loans are provided to a special purpose vehicle. Talking about one bank loan is meaningless in project finance. We will see that there are different tranches of loan, and so we have to analyze them. So the third point is which tranches are used in a project finance deal, tranches of loan. And finally, uh, it is quite obvious that since the lending banks have only a guarantee represented by the cash flows generated by the project company, it is uh, important for banks uh, to put their hands on all the assets with which the special purpose vehicle performs its duties. And so, uh, the fourth key point is which kind of guarantees, which kind of collateral can the SPV allow to the creditors? It is the problem of collateral that in technical terms uh, is called security package in a project finance deal. So, the final point will be which kind of collateral 
can be used in project finance and which kind of security package can be allowed to creditors. Okay? These are the four key points I would like to stress this afternoon. At any time, if there is any question, stop me and ask me. Okay? Good. First step to move on. Role of banks and syndication. Uh, basically, when we are talking about big investment projects and infrastructure projects, I told you that it is very rare that only one bank provides funds to the project company. And in fact, there are at least uh, two basic categories of intermediaries that act as counterparties for the project company. The first one is uh, the advisor of the SPV, and the second is the arranger of the loan. Let's explain what they, did, what they do inside a project finance transaction. First of all, the advisor. The advisor, basically, the name, say it, gives advice, gives consultancy to the sponsors of the SPV. So basically, the advisor is a consultant. Uh, in the, its main scope as a consultant for sponsors is to help sponsors to organize the deal and to make this deal financially viable meaning uh, a deal that can be easily sold on the bank market in order to get fund to finance the project uh, basically what consultants do are basically uh, to identify with sponsors the key critical points of uh, the project and so they identify the key issues surrounding the project. If the sponsors have prepared a financial plan to be submitted to banks to help them reviewing it in order to make it more sellable to the financing banks, so review the business plan. And in a certain sense, to help sponsors uh, to uh, identify maybe all of the other consultants that can help them moving on the project, legal advisors, technical advisors, fiscal advisors and financial modelers and so assistance in the first phase of study assistance in first stages okay pay attention to one important thing uh, the advisor doesn't provide money into the project its main scope is to provide assistance, not money. And in fact, it is uh, very clear, looking at the market data, that uh, uh, the main institutions that are highly ranked into the top positions of the league tables are not necessarily banks. For example, we can also have advisors like PricewaterhouseCoopers or KPMG or Ernst Young that are not financial intermediaries but that's quite obvious because in this case what is required is brain intensive work not money okay so basically advisor provides brain not money and so not necessarily it is a bank not banks at least not necessarily okay not necessarily banks the final objective, the final uh, goal that the advisor seeks is to be, a, to be able to find an arranger that is open to take over the project and to find a set. So its final goal is to find an arranger, a bank, that is open to finance the project. Okay? So basically, its final scope is to move the SPV toward an arranger. And for this final result, 
it is paid the success, uh, success fee. So, for all the work that he has done in order to make the project finance, uh, to be financed by an arranger, he will get a compensation whose name is technically the success fee. Obviously, it may also be the case that sometimes uh, the idea of the sponsor is slightly blurred, it's not clear. And so, it also can happen that after uh, an initial phase of a feasibility study or pre-feasibility study, the advisor finds uh, that that project is not financially sound and so can be financed with a project finance uh, structure. Of course, for all the work he has done before, he has to be paid. So, for all the work that he has done before making the project available to an arranger, he receives a compensation that obviously is much lower than the success fee, whose name is retainer fee. Okay? So, during this phase, the compensation for the advisor is uh, usually named retainer fee. So everything the advisor does is paid, obviously, at different levels. What actually the advisor seeks uh, is a good success fee, and we will see uh, why this happens. Retainer fee is, if you want, a reimbursement of the costs incurred during the phase. Uh, it's not the retainer fee that is interesting for an advisor. Just to give you an idea about the level of uh, the retainer fees that can be paid to an advisory for a middle range project, uh, retainer fee is paid on a monthly basis and usually is agreed between the startup of the project. Uh, usually, market standards for uh, medium to top project is between 15 to 20,000 euros per month. Just to cover the expenses of travels, studies, data collection, analysts, but that's not the real big piece of money available. What is interesting for the advisor is actually the success fee, because the success fee is not a fixed amount. It is obviously an amount proportional to the amount of loans that the advisor has been able to find for the sponsors of the SPD. Okay? Usually, again, market standards identify a range for such kind of success fee, and although the market is now moving toward lower level fees because competition is very strong, we can basically say that the range goes between 0.5% and 1% of the syndicated debt of debt amount. So, for example, if I am able to find an arranger for a project whose value is 200 million euros, hmm, uh, I will gain 1%, so 2 million euros, on that syndicated law. Okay? Pay attention to one fact. Success fee is calculated, and this is standard practice in the market, on the debt amount, not on the value of the project. Uh, there are two basic reasons for this market practice, and they are very easy uh, to, to, be, to be understood. The first one is obvious. If you look at the SPV, and the SPV has a balance sheet that is done this way, SPV balance sheet, the balance sheet will uh, show on the left hand side the value of assets, and on the right hand side a mix of debt and equity. I told you that the success fee is uh, related to, is linked to, the value of debt, not the total amount of funds. Two reasons for this. The first, 
quite obvious. Um, should I calculate the value of the success fee based on assets, I would require to the sponsors to pay me also on the amount of funds that they provide to the project. And that's absurd. They are my customer. Why do they have to pay for the amount of money they provide to the project? Meaningless. Okay? So, the first reason is equity is provided by sponsors. And so why to make them pay for what they provide to the, to the project? It's provided by sponsors. Second, and more important, if I uh, link the value of success fee to the amount of loan, I create a form of incentive for the advisor to try to work on very aggressive solutions. I mean, I ask the advisor to work with me to identify a business plan whose debt, rate, debt equity ratio is uh, stretched to a maximum level. In this way, if I'm able to include into the financial package a larger amount of debt, shareholders will provide a lower amount of equity given the total amount of the project. And in this sense, they will save equity and so their internal rate of return will be higher. I don't know if it is clear. Basically, I'm saying, if you have a certain value of the project, let's say 100, and you are working with the sponsors with one goal, to minimize the contribution of equity, if I pay you a success fee based on the amount of debt, I will incentivize you as an advisor to try all the possible solution to create a business plan that includes a higher level of leverage. And that's good news for the sponsors. Okay? So the second reason is because a success fee that is related to that creates an incentive to, uh, in a sense, sell to the arranger higher than to equity ratios. And in the perspective of sponsors to save a preacher's equity capital. Okay? I don't know if it is clear. Hmm? Good. Obviously, this incentive would disappear should I proportionate the success fee to the value of asset because the value of asset is independent of the amount of debt and equity with which you finance those amount of assets. Okay? Sufficiently clear for you? Good. So, advisor, not necessarily bank, retainer fee, success fee. There is one drawback in using an advisor separated from an arranger. And in fact, what the market is showing us now is that in most cases, the, uh, you know, the actor playing the role of an arranger is also the advisor. And so he gets a joint mandate advisor arranging. The market trends are demonstrating us that the integration between the two roles uh, is today normal market practice. And uh, it's clearly why. If you, if you uh, appoint first one advisor and then the arranger, you have to pay both for playing basically the same things. Because once the arranger has obtained the mandate, it is quite obvious that he will have to review key issues, review the business plan, to identify assistance for the SPV, because at the very end, the arranger has to propose this loan to other banks. And so you are paying twice for the same tasks. And that's not good news. So there is a, a major drawback in the separation between advisor and arranger. The separation when advisor, when the advisor is different from the arranger, the result of this difference is only one. The cost of advisory rises.
if the product is not particularly large, this is a crucial point. You can't appoint separately advisor and arranger. And the solution becomes a joint mandate for advisor and arranger to one single actor. Okay? So the solution becomes one single mandate, one joint. It is technically said joint mandate. Any question about this? Sufficiently clear? <coughs> Good. Joint mandate. So let's see what the arranger actually does inside a product finance deal. If we are talking about an arranger, all these things must again be performed. Because as a bank, if I receive a mandate and I don't want to finance the whole amount of loan on my asset side, I have to sell part of the loan to third banks. And so it is quite obvious that I have to repeat this exercise because I have to work closely with the sponsors of the SPV in order to identify key issues, in order to work on the business plan, in order to make it sellable to all events. And so all the things that the advisor has done must be repeated. So the arranger basically plays two key jobs. The first one is very close, very similar to the one of the, the advisor, and so basically to work with the SPV sponsors in order to optimize uh, the business plan of uh, the special purpose vehicle. And so, in a sense, he plays actually an advisory activity. Obviously, since uh, from this point on the project is moving toward the lending phase, this advisory is much closer to an advisory played with a team of uh, actors, including the sponsors, including lawyers, including the engineers, and including, obviously, all the other banks that will be included into the group of financiers. If you want, you can imagine the arranger as the coordinator of a team of experts working jointly on the mandate of organizing the law for the SP. Okay? In parallel to this activity of advisory, the second, and obviously the most important, activity is the provision of funds, because what actually is required to the arranger is the provision of funds. I need money to finance the loan and to finance the project. So, the provision of funds. And this is the most, uh, in a sense, qualifying activity for the arranger. Pay attention. If the key function played by the arranger is the provision of money, uh, compared to the advisor uh, competition market, where not necessarily advisor are banks, there is a strict link between the role of arranger and the role of banks, because only banks, particularly large commercial banks or large conglomerates, have money in order to finance. Uh, I told you about KPMG, PricewaterhouseCoopers, they can't play the role of arrangers simply because they don't have capital to lend. And that's why the arranger role is basically played by large commercial banks. I, I want to be clear, large commercial banks, banks with branches on the road, ABN AMRO, Royal Bank of Scotland, Bank Intesa, Unicredit, so banks that can collect the deposit from the road, banks that have a large financial strength in order to have money to be provided to projects. Okay? So, don't be uh, 
don't be uh, uh, surprised to find that into the league tables, uh, the key roles in the top ranked league tables uh, covered by big commercial banks. And market trends are telling us that the future will be uh, a move of these big commercial banks toward this activity because it is much easier for a bank with money to purchase advisory boutiques than the vice versa. It is much more uh, frequent to see an acquisition by a bank of an investment bank than vice versa. Okay? That's quite obvious. In the future we will see, and we are experiencing right now, an integration process with which big commercial banks purchase pieces and pieces of advisory activity in order to be able to provide a one-stop shopping and conquire joint mandates, advisory and arrangement. Okay? Sufficiently clear for you? Any question? Fine. Now, let's move one step forward. Uh, again, arranger. Since uh, advisors are paid, and they are paid a retainer fee and uh, a success fee, which is the fee structure that the arranger obtains in an, a mandate for a project finance? In order to reply to this question, we must first specify one important thing. And this thing is, it is quite obvious that the arranger has all the interest to conquire a mandate, but hasn't the interest to fund all the amount of money for the project. Its basic idea is, I get the mandate, I will be paid for that mandate, but then I will try to sell a fair part of the loan to third parties, including them in a group of financiers. This group is called syndicate. Okay? So in order to answer the question, which fees are paid to the arranger, we must first to consider that it is standard practice in the market of project finance to build up what is called a syndicate group or syndication group. Uh, the syndication group is basically a structure, a, a pyramid structure, with a very low number of key players here and a large number of participants here. What is exactly a syndication? A syndication is a group of banks whose leader is basically the arranger, often named mandated lead arranger. Its technical name is mandated lead arranger. Mandated lead arranger. The mandated lead arranger, name say it, is the arranger who has the mandate to organize the financing for this transaction. Uh, usually, uh, the mandated lead arranger, I save you all boring stuff regarding the different ways of organizing syndications. Uh, I arrive straight to the point. In project finance, one important thing for the SPV and the sponsors is to get a guarantee by the mandated lead arranger that even if the market is cold and is not able and is not open to provide funds, I will get the funds from the mandated lead arranger and a restricted group of banks. This guarantee is very important for me. Otherwise, I give a mandate and I'm not sure to get the money I need in order to carry out the project. Okay? For this reason, it is very often, it is very uh, often that the mandated lead arranger organize immediately after the awarding of the mandate a restricted group of banks. Usually they are very large banks uh, and each of these banks takes a large part of the loan and underwrite, this is the technical term, this part of the loan. 
To underwrite basically means to provide a guarantee that even if the banks are not able to sell the loan on the market, they will provide funds anyway. Okay? So, this first part of the syndication group and this part forms the so-called underwriting group. Writing group. And this underwriting group uh, is basically formed uh, by, uh, obviously, the mandated leader arranger, for sure, and uh, it is represented by the so-called co-arranging banks, and for sure, and maybe, I say maybe because here we don't have market standards, sometimes also the so-called lead managers. I say maybe because uh, sometimes uh, the intercreditor agreement, I mean the agreement between the participants of this syndicate, <coughs> sometimes can include the lead managers inside the underwriting group, and sometimes exclude them from the underwriting group. In any case, important uh, for you is to remember that there is a strict group of banks taking on a large part of the loan and uh, included into the higher part of our pyramid. Mandated with arranger, co-arranging banks, and maybe lead managers. The bottom of the pyramid, uh, Oh, I, forget to, I forgot to say, lead managers are usually banks that can be labeled as such only when they are open to fund an amount of money that is above a minimum threshold defined by the arranger. Let's say, if you are open to lend to the special purpose vehicle an amount above, let's say, 50 million euros, you can get uh, the level of lead manager. And that's important for building up tracking records for this. Can you also the no, no, no. We are talking about uh, uh, basically a group of banks. It is very rare that a private person is invited to participate in syndicate. We are talking about interbank relationship, for but sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. We are talking, no, 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 no. We are talking about bank syndication. Here you can find basically only banks. And uh, pay attention, large banks uh, and banks with, uh, you know, international standing. Because if, for example, Citigroup U, uh, US has to finance a project in Turkmenistan or uh, Kazakhstan, he goes uh, looking on the market uh, to banks with a strong reputation at an international level. So we are not talking of banks, but usually big banks with an international profile. Okay? Fine. So which is the difference between a co-arranging bank and a lead manager? Uh, the difference between a co-arranging bank and a lead manager? Uh, yes. Usually the co-arranging banks uh, are invited from the very beginning. So, if you receive uh, the mandate, let's say, today, 12 October, in the first week, uh, your first goal is to organize a restricted group that is really open to open up the bag and uh, put out the money, okay? Lead managers usually follow one step later on in the process. Once I have organized the group of arranging and co-arranging banks, uh, and then I'm open to, you, you know, to spread the syndicate, I include, first of all, the big banks, lead managers, and then the bottom line, the so-called participant banks. Participants are common banks. They can also be smaller banks. Whose main scope is basically to provide only money. So there isn't any particular difference between a project finance and other lending 
practice when talking about participants. These are basically lenders, pure lenders. And uh, guys, pay attention. We are outside the underwriting group. So for these participants, there isn't any commitment to provide funds. They don't have underwritten the loan. They simply are invited to provide money below the threshold that guarantees the level of lead management. Quite easy. Okay? Sufficiently clear for you? Usually, when we are talking about this first step, when the mandated lead arranger invites co-arranging banks, we are talking about the uh, so-called first stage syndication. It is the first step in the syndication process. So, the invitation to these banks uh, is called first stage syndication. Once the first stage syndication is complete, the members of the first stage syndication can scale back, can sell are, uh, are allowed to try, if they can, to sell part of the loans to participants, the so-called general syndication. Okay? So there are two stages from a, a time point of view. The first stage, you invite a smaller group, and this group underwrites 100% of the loan. Second phase, since you don't want to keep all the loan on your balance sheet, you are allowed, by the special purpose vehicle, to sell to participants. General syndication phase. Okay? So uh, it depends. It depends. Sometimes, if you look at the intercreditor agreement, the agreement between creditors, uh, there isn't a standard in this. Sometimes lead manager refer to a member of the underwriting group. So, you are required to lend a certain minimum amount and to underwrite it. Sometimes, this doesn't happen. And so, you are allowed to spend the title of lead manager also without having a, a commitment of underwriting. Much depends on specific deals. In this case, pay attention. I, I have hypothesized that in this case, lead managers are also members of the underwriting group. But that's not always the case. Okay? I don't know if I've answered your question. Okay. Uh, other questions about this? Everything is clear? Fine. Uh, obviously, to organize a syndicate, uh, costs to the SPV, and this is a revenue for the arranger. And this is the moment now to clarify the structure of fees that is paid into a syndicate. Because looking at this exhibit, it is quite easy to identify the different forms of payment that a syndicate can obtain by the SP. Uh, just to keep things simple, uh, I will say that basically the SPV signs a loan agreement not with the syndicate, but only with the arranger. Because keep in mind that there is only one mandated lead arranger. So the mandate has been awarded only to one bank. And so the relationship is bilateral. It's like to say, it's the SPV, the borrower, sees only one counterparty. And this counterparty is the mandated lead arranger. For the scope of financing, uh, the SPV, uh, in a sense, maintains, keeps a relationship only with one bank, the mandated lead arranger, that is actually his lender. And uh, that's why uh, the payment for the organization of the syndicate is paid only to the mandated lead arranger, with uh, what is called the arranging fee. So, just to uh, be clear, the arranging fee is paid in one solution at the closing of the contract 
when the loan is materially awarded and is paid once only to the mandated with the arranger for the whole amount. This arranging fee works very closely to the success fee that we analyzed before and again market standards tell us that the range of the arranging fee goes between 0.5 and 1 percent depending on the difficulty that the arranger finds in organizing the deal. Uh, the, mo the more aggressive the deal, the more unknown the more difficult the market condition, the higher the level of arranging fee. The higher the standard of sponsors, the lower the difficulties in terms of technology or sectors, uh, the, 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 more, uh, you know, uh, the more easy, uh, the easier conditions for the market calls for a lower level of arranging fees. Okay? But now the problem is, I pay an arranging fee to the mandated lead arranger, and uh, again, market practice, if you are an arranger and you have also played the role of advisor, and so the mandate was joint arranging advisory, it is standard in the market that when you uh, organize the syndicate, you discount two, three months of retainer fee to the SPV. So, if the SPV tells you, I pay you for the activity of advisor and arranging, and you are able to arrange a syndicate, it is common for an arranger to be paid 0.51% minus two or three months of retainer fee as a discount because you have obtained two mandates. Okay? So it's a sort of, you know, a grant, an allowance that the arranger pays to its SPV in order to have got the joint mandate advising arranger. Question. Uh, basically, you know, uh, it's quite difficult to, uh, to label it as a success fee because, pay attention, which is the success for the arranger to arrange? And so that's why you are talking about arranging fee. So in the moment you are able to arrange it, you say, okay, pay me arranging fee, the success fee of the advisor. Okay. Yeah. Uh, much yes, obviously this is a 0.51% and obviously if I have a joint mandate I negotiate also the success fee I didn't include it here because we are talking about a separate mandate but it is quite obvious that if, if you obtain the mandate to study the deal and then you obtain the mandate to arrange you can gain twice the first one is the arranging fee, you are able to organize the process, and then you are able to arrange it. Usually, this arranging fee covers the activity of organizing this phase. Yes, but before we call that, that's uh, one point of having this government mandate, is to cut the cost. Mm -hmm. Obviously, but it is quite obvious that the joint success plus arranging is lower than the sum of success fee plus arranging fee that you would have paid giving to separate mandates to different intermediaries. So it is quite obvious that you are appointed as a joint lead arranger and a joint advisor, the sum of success fee and arranging fee will be overall lower than the sum of success fee and arranging fee for two separate mandates. Hmm? Due to economies of scale, you save basically all of the phase of analysis because remember, uh, in the first phase, uh, advisor and arranger do the same thing. Okay? And the possibility to discount also two or three months of retainer fee is uh, going in this direction. Okay? Good. Okay, so now, the problem for us is, looking at only to the arranging fee, how can this arranging fee be paid also to the other members of the syndicate? Because also the other members of the syndicate have to receive something for their activity. And in fact, uh, what happens is that 
the mandated liberator takes all the amount of money coming from the SPV and in turn scales back, pays back something to the other members of the syndicate. There is a transfer, basically, of part of this arranging fee to the other members of the syndicate. And this transfer is based on what is usually called a waterfall structure. Waterfall structure, uh, for Italians, uh, una struttura cascata. Hmm? Uh, what is a waterfall structure? Waterfall structure is a very simple thing. The mandated leader ranger has the possibility to negotiate with all the participants, lead managers, co-arranging banks, uh, pure participants, the level of fees that will be paid for their participation. And uh, the amount of fees uh, can be fixed at the discretion of the mandated leader ranger. So it is not decided by the SPV, but by the mandated leader ranger itself. And usually the mandated leader ranger is open to recognize these fees. The first one, he pays for sure a co-arranging fee that pays the commitment of the co-arranging group to underwrite all the law. So the first fee that is paid back to the other members is the co-arranging fee. Co-arranging. Okay? And, uh, guys, it is quite obvious that if I receive a 1% arranging fee, I'm not obliged to repay exactly 1% to the co-arrangers. If my bargaining power is strong, I can pay and invite a co-arranger for a co-arranging fee of, let's say, 0.7%, the difference will be mine. Okay? Second, a co-arranging fee, second way of uh, paying, and the co-arranging fee obviously goes to payment to co-arranging banks. And uh, for uh, lead managers or other intermediate roles, uh, I didn't mention, for example, managers that are another category, not pure participants. Hmm? For banks that are not pure participants, Usually what is paid is a, a so-called management fee. So management fee is paid to lead managers and if this role exists in the syndicate, managers banks. Again, uh, it is not an obligation for the mandated lead arranger to transfer exactly the whole amount of arranging fee. If uh, its bargaining power is very strong, I can invite banks uh, and propose them to enter with a management fee of let's say 0.2, 0.3%. All the difference again will be mine. Okay? And finally, now we show an example uh, and we see how this waterfall structure works. Obviously, if I am mandated legal ranger, I will be, by definition, an underwriter. And by definition, I will be a participant, because at the very end I will finance. And, uh, obviously, I will receive three cumulative payments. The payment as an arranger, the payment as an underwriter, and the payment as a pure participant. So, if a bank plays more than one role inside the syndicate, it has the possibility to be paid more than once with different, with different combinations of fees. Clear? Sufficiently clear? Good. Now, uh, obviously, apart from uh, mandated lead arranger, co-arranging banks and lead managers, the only remuneration that participants receive, but I go very quickly on this, is uh, the interest rate on the loan as a normal lender, interest rate. And, of course, not of course, sorry, uh, interest rate, of course. Uh, another fee 
that is typical of long-term financing and project financing is one case, the so-called commitment fee. Let me spend just a couple of words about the commitment fee and then we can show an example of a question. Oh yeah, uh, obviously participants but also an underwriter because an underwriter necessarily is a participant and a mandated legal arranger because necessarily he lends money. So, when we are talking about the normal lending activity, lending activity is paid uh, in two ways. The first one with the interest rate on the amount that is provided to the SPV. And the second way is the payment of the commitment fee. And I explain you what commitment fee is called. Okay? Uh, as I told you, let me spend just a couple of words about the commitment fee. Suppose that uh, we are analyzing a business plan of uh, uh, a project finance deal. Pay attention, this is a business plan because the project hasn't started yet and hasn't been financed yet. Okay. Suppose, for example, that during the first year of the life of the project, the project needs money because, uh, you know, for example, the highway must be built and so I must get money from the bank. Hmm? Suppose that the sketch the data are as follows. Suppose that the uh, used amount of loan is, let's say, 150 million euros. Because, for example, in the first year I have to pay the first part of works for the construction of the highway. And so the amount of uh, loan that has been used is 150. Suppose that the total committed loan, I mean the uh, global amount that the banks are, uh, have been open to provide to the SPV is 300 million. And so you have an unused part of funds, still available. Used loan, available funds, available total funds, total, uh, in technical terms, total committed loan. Committed loan is, let's say, 300 million euro, and suppose that uh, we have, for the first year, a number of days of 365, because our uh, plan is calculated year by year. We will see, when analyzing the capital budgeting of project finance, that in the first year, uh, the mm, you know, the calculation is made uh, with shorter intervals. Months, six months, quarter, okay? But that's not important for us, for the moment. Suppose that during year and Q1, the uh, interest rate, usually fixed based on, on a rebor plus spread, is fixed at 5.5%, okay? A participant to this uh, uh, deal, obviously, we get on the used amount of loan the interest rate because it will be remunerated based on the interest rate available for that period. And so the first way to compensate banks for the lending activity will be to calculate on the used loan the interest rate and calculate the interest that will be paid. We will see, we'll be capitalized, but that's another story. We will see it later. There is one problem. The syndicate uh, has uh, made available a loan of 300 million euros. And do you know that every time a bank provides, uh, sorry, um, promises to provide funds, because this is a promise, and this promise is used only partially, the regulations for capital in banks requires you to allocate part of your equity capital into the balance sheet. Basically, for every 100 euros of committed loans, you have to allocate a certain portions of equity, and this equity costs to the bank. So, it would be unfair to leave uh, an amount of unused fund of 150 unpaid for the syndicate. That's why, on the unused fund, I mean 
funds made available and not used, the SPV has to pay the commitment. The name says it, a commitment fee. And the commitment fee, CF, can be easily calculated, period by period, by comparing the committed funds at the beginning of the period minus the outstanding loan at the beginning of the period, the used funds at the beginning of the period, minus outstanding amount, begin period, BP, times the commitment fee, percentage commitment fee. So I take the difference, in this case, 300 million minus 150 million times, let's say, 25 basis points, 0.25% times 0 0.25 times, guys, the number of days included in the period analyzed. In this case, 365 days. Okay? Times T over 360 or 365 as you prefer. Much depends on the notation. In this case, 300 minus 150 times 0 0.25 0 .25 times 365 over 365. In project finance, you pay everything. You pay everything. Okay? But it is quite obvious. Here, you have a commitment of a very large amount of money, and the opportunity cost for banks is very high. That's why they must require some form of compensation. Okay? Good. So, on the interest rate is very easy. It's a used amount of funds times the interest rate times the period of time included into the calculation. So, in this case, it's 150 times 5.5% times T, where T is the number of days included in our period under observation. Okay? Any question about this? Clear the difference between interest on the used part, commitment fee on the unused part of funds. Okay? Good. And now, let's get back to the problem of the waterfall structure of the fees. So we are now not talking about the usual part of the loan, but we are talking about the fees that must be paid in order to the for the organization of the deal. Uh, you have this example on your slides, uh, uh, and uh, so I will simply uh, show you how to get to the final result. This is the situation. Look at the slide. Uh, you have it, and so you can't also put the pen on the table and follow on this. Uh, let's see the example. The example shows a syndication uh, of 200, uh, 200 million euros with a, uh, with a split of uh, advisor and arranging, an advisor success fee of 0.75%, an arranging fee of 1%, and guys, pay attention, the advisor, the mandated uh, lead arranger, gets 1%. But when he invites a co-arranger, he pays to the co-arranger not 1%, but 0.80, and so he can get the difference between 1% and 0.80. And then he can invite also managers into the syndicate, offering them a 0.20% uh, upfront management fee. So if you are a manager, you will be entitled to receive 0.5% management fee. Okay? Now, our goal is, uh, first of all, Let's see how the strategy of syndication by the mandated lead arranger is carried out. So, the first thing we want to know is, I have a mandate, I have a mandate for 200 million. The first thing I want to know is how I split this 200 million in the general syndication phase and in the first stage syndication. That is important for me in order to identify the different roles that the different banks will play. Second, once I have identified the roles, I can calculate the fees. Okay? Good. Let's see what happens. The situation is this one. Look. Look at the exhibit and look how to read it. 
the first column is the member of the sign indicator. Okay? Uh, in this case, uh, A bank uh, is the advisor and B bank is the leader ranger. C, D, A, and F are respectively a co arranger, a manager, a manager, and a manager. Which kind of fee will be paid? As, we told, as I told you before, the advisor will get a success fee, the mandated lead arranger will receive an arranging fee, uh, the co-arranger, again, an arranging, better, a co-arranging fee, and finally, manager, manager, and manager will receive upfront fee, upfront fee, and upfront fee. Sufficiently clear for you? Manager receives an upfront management fee, the co arranger receives a co arranging fee. Now, two steps. Do you remember? The first step is to organize a restricted group of banks that will underwrite 100% of the amount of the loan. And this is the first stage syndication. Look, the underwritten amount has been underwritten evenly between. B bank, the mandated lead arranger, and C bank, the co arranger, 100 and 100. So basically, the group of underwriters in this case is composed only by two banks that takes over the whole amount of loan, 100 and 100 each. Okay? If the market situation is so worse that I'm not able to sell part of the loan on the market, I will borrow. This part of the loan of my balance sheet, 100 million back B, 100 million back C. And that's not good news. If an arranger and a co-arranger are very good, they are very likely to find other banks that with them will split the amount of loans and will, in a sense, purchase part of the loan from either B bank or C bank. And that's what happens in the so-called general syndication phase when I start selling parts of the loan to third banks. And how these banks have operated? Look, they had an initial committed amount of 100 million each, but they were successful in placing loans on third banks so to reduce the final financed amount, what is called in technical terms final take, what I finally take in my balance sheet of 25 million the first bank and 25 million the second one. How many loans do I have sold? Easy, 75 million this one and 75 million this one. And the 150, 75 plus 75, will be split 60 plus 40 is 100 plus 50 is 150. So basically the general syndication is, you know, sort of secondary market for the loan. I resell this loan to third parties interested to participate in this deal. Clear for all? So, first stage syndication, restricted group. Second phase, the restricted group sell on the market part of the loans. And this is the final result. Clear for all? Good. Now, let's start and uh, identify what is exactly this water cost structure. What happens actually when uh, the mandated leader ranger receives the arranging fee of 1% and then scales back this arranging fee to the other banks. Let us see. It is very easy. And it is actually a waterfall structure. It's a sort of water that flows inside different stages of the process. I will show you very simply. Obviously, in this case, advisor and arranger are separated. And so the advisor will take 75 basis points on the total syndicated amount. And so, if the total amount is 200 million, 75 basis point is 0.75 or 200. And so it is very simple. He goes away, he has been paid, and uh, he goes outside the scene. What remains is the mandated legal arranger, the co arranger, and the managers. And so, let's see what happens. Uh, we said that the total amount of loan is 1%. So, 
the special purpose vehicle pays 1% on an amount of 200 million euros. Uh, and so the total pool of funds available is 1% of 200 million, 2 million euros. Okay? And so 1% of 200 million euros is 2 million euros. These 2 million euros are paid by the special purpose vehicle to the mandated leader ranger. And so, the mandated leader ranger, MLA, receive 2 million euros. And now the problem for the MLA is to pay back something to the other members of the syndicate. First, look at the syndicate. I had to pay C bank. Oh, this is the mandated leader ranger story is B bank. B bank. First counterpart I had to pay, my co-arranger. Because my co-arranger underwrites an amount of 100 million. And looking at the amount of fees that I negotiated with him, do I pay 1% on the amount of 100? How much is the co-arranging fee for my co-arranger? Is 0.8. So, from this amount of 2 million, I take some money to pay 0.8 on the underwritten amount by the C bank, my co-lead arranger. Okay, very easy. I have a pool of money and I take from the pool everything that is used to pay my counterparties. So, to the co-arranger, I pay 0.8% times 100 million euros. Very easy. And the amount that is paid is 800,000 euros. 800,000. Let's stop for a moment. I have received 2 million. I have paid in the first stage syndication an amount of 800,000 euros. The remaining amount, technically called residual pool, at this stage is the difference between what the arranger has received and what he has paid back. This is the residual pool, first stage syndication. Residual pool. And the residual pool is uh, 1 million 200 thousand euros. Sufficiently clear? Very easy. This amount is still in the hands of the mandated to the region. He still has available 1.2 million euros. But now he has to pay the commitment of uh, the participant banks. Because, look, and remember, if I am a co-arranger but I am also a participant, I have to be paid twice one as co-arranger and the other as participant. And so now I have to pay the management fees to all the banks different from myself. <coughs> so I have to pay a management fee on the financed amount to the C bank, D bank, E bank and F bank. What remains is actually the remuneration of the arranger. Okay? So, this pool of 1.2 million euros is used, 1.2 million, in order to pay the final part of our syndication. Look at the exhibit. Look at the exhibit. I am a B bank, so 1.2 million are mine. I simply have to pay now C bank, D bank, E bank and F bank and how much do I will pay? I will pay 0.20% because the upfront management fee is fixed at 0.20 and so basically what I do is 0.20 times respectively 25 million, 40 million, 50 million, 60 million you see? And so, C bank, D, E, 
and that band. Applying to all of them 0.20 on the final amount. Because in this stage, we are no more in the first stage syndication, but we are in the general syndication, where all bands provide the final take. Okay? If I calculate then, for example, in the first case, if I apply 0.2% on 25 million C bank, I get a final value of 50,000. For D, if I apply 0.2% uh, on 40, I get 80. And so for E and F, on E I have 50 and again uh, 25, uh, sorry, 100,000 euros. And finally on 60 million, I will have 60 million times 0.2% and so 120 million, uh, 120,000, sorry. These are the payment for upfront management fees, and so we are paying basically the managers. This is a very simplified syndicate. Uh, in normal syndicates, here we will have a difference between managers, co-managers, and, and pure participants. And so we can also differentiate the fees according to the different category. Of land. Uh, finally, here we have a, a total amount that must be spent on of 350,000 euros. So, the original pool was 1 million point two. I have spent 350,000 euros for the managers. Finally, what remains? The final receivable pool that goes to who? Who gets this final? The mandated middle ranger. So the final receivable pool after the general syndication, final receivable is basically uh, 850,000 euros to the mandated middle ranger. Okay? Look what happens. Uh, guys, this is a, a very intuitive point, but not so intuitive sometimes. Uh, if the mandated bill arranger gains fees on the underwritten amount, 100 million, but is, uh, and so uh, this amount is uh, independent of the final take, 25 million. Okay? So I will employ 25 million, but anyway, since I underwrote an amount of 100 million, I will be paid on 100, regardless of the final amount I will lend. And so, if the mandated deal arranger is very clever in selling a large part of the loan, he will get a high underwriting fee and he will employ a low amount of capital in terms of uh, pure loans. Okay? If you calculate the return on the investment, the higher the ability to sell loans in the general syndication phase, the higher the internal rate of return of the deal for the arranger. And so the ability of the arranger is, first, to be able to invite a large number of banks. Second, to be able to sell to final participant a large amount of loans. In this way, its internal rate of return will go up because the amount employed is very low. Look what we have. I have calculated it. And this is the final situation. Basically what we did is to calculate for all the banks, B bank, the mandated leader arranger, C, D, E, and F, what they get, bank by bank. Obviously, if B Bank has gained 850,000 euros, but it has employed only a final take of 25 million, the denominator of the ratio falls down dramatically, even if the fee that has been gained <coughs> remains the same. Question. What, uh, 
Yes, it is a cumulative one. So, it's like a, it's like to say, I pay you a given amount. This pay you for everything. The ability for you is to be able to scale back a lower amount than the one that has been paid to you. If you get one percent, your ability is to invite other banks and invite them at less than one percent. Okay, sufficient to clear. Good. In this case, look, the two banks, B Bank and C Banks, get a return on invested capital of 3.40 and 3.40, compared to the other that gets only the lead manager fee, and so 0.2%. You can get easily these values by uh, dividing the final row of this scheme by the effective employed capital by every bank. 25 million this one, 25 million this one, and uh, going back, 40 million, 50 million, and 60 million. So if you compare the amount of fees with the capital employed, nominal capital employed, not capital at risk, you get immediately the value of the you know, nominal effective uh, remuneration of this. Uh, participant. Okay? Uh, the concept is you can try to simulate other situations. You can, for example, uh, repeat the same exercise, supposing that the final take is not 25 million but 10 million. You recalculate and you will see that the value of uh, the um, uh, return on capital employed is much higher. I suggest you to prove this. Try to imagine a general syndication where you are able to sell more than 150 and to get only 10 and 10. The denominator falls down. Since the numerator doesn't fall down uh, at the same proportion, the value gets up. Okay? Sufficiently clear for all? Question? One question. What if the manager plans to afford, for example, B and F, they can hold? Then B and C, they have to provide the underwriting fee, under million. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's, uh, yes, it, it, can be, it can be a case actually. The question of your colleague is, suppose that uh, D, E and F uh, at the fourth at the same time. Uh, in this case, uh, usually, but we are, you know, in a situation of pathology and uh, this is clearly a problem of lawyers and not of bankers. And so, it is very often that into intercreditor agreement, lawyers include some form of pact uh, to discipline what will happen in case of default. Uh, usually, when uh, there is a default, uh, there is the possibility for the mandated leader arranger to take over the amount of loans that were allowed by the other banks uh, and try to organize and try to you know, call some other banks inside the syndicate. That's what happens usually. But it is a very rare case. Remember, in project finance, only big, strong bank with great reputation are invited. The weak point is never common in project finance. Okay? Good. Uh, just two more uh, questions. I told you, the first point, roles. Second point, syndication. Third point, spread and fees. And so, interest rate and fees. What else do I have to include? Uh, basically, the security package and uh, the collateral for this loan. And uh, very quickly, the structure of the three tranches of loan. Very quickly. I would start with the third point, loan tranches. And then the security package. Uh, long tranches. At the beginning of this lecture, I told you, talking about 
syndicating one loan is meaningless in project finance. There isn't one loan in project finance, but more than one. And every loan that is syndicated into a project finance deal usually covers one portion of the total amount of funds needed by the SPD. Okay? The idea is uh, very simple, if you think, and uh, can be explained uh, quite easily in this way. First of all, suppose that we are considering a project, and this project uh, has a certain uh, life cycle. It starts, it develops, it closes at a certain point of time. It starts at time zero. This is the time that flows. On the vertical axis, I, uh, <coughs> sorry, I diagram uh, the cumulative value of the free cash flow of the project. I mean, uh, I calculate year by year the amount of cash flows coming from the operational activity that the project is able to generate. And I sum year by year this value. It is quite obvious that if I include here the sum of free cash flows, during the first part of its life, the project obviously doesn't generate cash. On the contrary, it absorbs cash. Okay. Suppose, for example, four years and a half of, for construction of uh, an highway, the Cremona Mount of a highway, a project that I'm following exactly right now as a consultant. Four point half year of construction, four Four point half year, I don't see any money coming from this project. This project will eat money. And uh, usually it will eat money until the end of the construction phase. Here. End of construction. Starting from the end of construction, hopefully, hopefully, the traffic on this highway will allow the SPV to recover the amount of funds employed. After a certain period, the traffic will recover the cash deficit. This is the payback period of the investment, and usually this payback is not close to zero. And then the project develops. At the end of 60 years, because the concession given for this highway is 60 years, and so is 2066, starting from now. Hmm? Uh, the highway will be uh, returned to the public administration at zero cost, because it is supposed that the sponsors have get all the money back during the life of the construction. Okay? Sufficiently clear? Good. If a project every project finance behaves this, behaves this way, it is quite obvious that it is impossible to think to include into the project finance setting a revolving credit. You know the concept of revolving credit. A revolving credit is a certain amount of money that is lent to a borrower. If the borrower repays the amount, the amount of credit available returns to the original amount. It is meaningless. What I need in project finance is a loan that is used all in this phase and is repaid all in this phase. It is not revolving. I give you a certain amount of money as a, a loan to purchase your home. You buy the home and then you return me the loan without revolving the credit. You don't need it. Okay? Sufficiently clear? So, the trenches, regardless of the trenches we are considering, are always organized as follows. There is always one phase where the funds are used, loan is withdrawn, is used if you want. After the construction expires, the loan is repaid. And guys, look, the loan is repaid here. You can't get the risk as a bank to have the loan repaid here. Because if the concession expires, there is no more money to pay the loan. And so, the longer the period between the final date of the loan and the final date of the concession, 
the better the situation for banks. This is a safety cushion for me. I have more time, eventually, to restructure the loan. This is actually what, in technical terms, is called tail of the loan. Longer tails are better for banks. If, for example, the loan is reimbursed in 2025 and the concession expires 2020 and 66, I have more or less 40 years to restructure the project if things do not go in the forecasted way. Okay? Shorter tails are very risky. Shorter tails are very risky. So, remember, first feature of long branches one, not revolving, never. Not revolving. Second feature and second problem. Uh, and then I think we can, we can <coughs> stop the lecture. Just one more point and then we're finished. Uh, suppose just to make things simple, that the cost of the highway during the four point half years of construction is, let's say, uh, more or less, the numbers are these ones, 800 million euros. This is the actual cost of the Mantova Cremona highway, hmm? more or less. Obviously, when the constructor presents the invoices for the construction of the road, he will present you a bill saying cost of the highway 800 million plus VAT, in Italian IVA. Hmm? And uh, guys, it is quite obvious that in normal condition, a firm has sales on which he collects value added tax. And so value added tax is neither a credit nor a debit. It is simply a difference. Okay? But think of an highway that, that for four and a half years has no sales to compensate with this credit for that. You have to find a set. Because the total cost of the project is no longer 800 million, but it is 800 million plus 20% of value added tax. Sufficiently clear for you? And so, plus VAT, 20%, and so 160 million. And so total cost to be financed is not 800, but it is 960. Remember, because in the budgeting of your project, you have to set aside money also for financing the VAT. And VAT is a big sum of money. <laughs> That's why the two basic tranches of loans are respectively given to the SPV in order to finance the cost of works, the so-called base facility, or base loan, if you prefer. Base loan covers the amount of construction costs, and so it is a line of credit that will be allowed to the special purpose vehicle in order to cover the amount of costs incurred for the project. Okay? The other tranche is the tranche that is allowed in order to cover the obvious consequence, the VAT on the cost of construction. And it is called, actually, VAT facility or VAT loan. So there is a special loan that is used by the SPV in order to finance the VAT. And so VAT facility. Finally, uh, let's say 4 and 4.1, because they are only eventual. First, we are planning a project, but we are do not sure that the total amount of cost will be 800 million. Maybe some unexpected events can occur. We were talking about insuring uh, non recurring risks. Suppose that the risk uh, blocks the construction and costs keep going on. You have to cover this part. And obviously, this part cannot be covered by the base facility.
because base facility is referred to a base case, the cost in normal conditions. In order to cover contingencies, in Italian imprevisti, it is included one more additional tranche, the so-called standby facility. Name says it. It is a standby. It is there, it is available only to cover unexpected events and only when the base facility has been already used. Okay? So it is the final part of the loan that is used to cover unexpected events, the so-called standby facility. Okay? Sufficiently clear? And finally, in order to finance the recurring working capital cycle, in this case, yes, we have a revolving facility, it is a working capital facility. In order to finance inventories, in order to finance uh, working capital, suppliers and customers. Hmm? Working capital facility. VC facility. Okay, guys? Every loan for every specific purpose. We will see next time, at the very beginning of my last lecture, next week, uh, basically the cost of these funds. And you can imagine that the cost is lower, very low, because that will be compensated during, uh, cost, uh, during operation, particularly high, unexpected events, quite high, because it covers, you know, recording working capital needs inside the project. Okay? Any question? Okay. I think we're finished. Thank you very much. See you next week.